is the first of the live sessions and it's the first of three. The focus for tonight's input will be numeracy rich environments. So I'm hoping that you've signed up and you're in the right place. Um, we're just going to get started, um, but just a few things to say before we move on. During that last series of um, webinars that Yvonne and I delivered, there was some attendees saying that they were unable to access the chat. And we're not quite sure why, but if for any reason you can't e access the chat, um, you'll see there's a QR code on the screen just now. If you follow that, what we've done is we've set up a kind of padlet, um, almost like a car park, and it just allows you to post any questions, thoughts or comments um, as we go through, just in case you can't access the chat for whatever reason. But if you can access the chat, we would love to hear from you um, throughout the session. And I've just posted into the chat there um, a link that will take you to the, the Padlet. So hopefully you've been able to get a copy of that. But if you can see the chat, it's, it's better if you can post straight into the chat and we can try and pick that up as we go through the session. So. Let's move on to the next slide. Um, the next slide we're going to talk about um, a, a few technical things, I suppose. We'll, we'll talk about the aims and the plan for the sessions in, in, in a wee bit. But before we do that, we're just going to go over a few sort of housekeeping almost rules. And as you'll see, there's quite a lot of people on the call um, tonight. We're expecting quite a high number of attendees. And because of that, if you could um, ensure your microphones are muted and your cameras are off. We just hope that that would protect the bandwidth and ensure that a smooth experience um, for everyone is, is what happens. As I said, there will be opportunities for you to join in and, and share with us your thoughts and your comments as we go through. And the chat function will um, be able to do that for most or, or hopefully all of you. But we also have that Padlet that I mentioned that will be used to gather some of your thoughts and your comments too. Yvonne and I will be providing a recording of the session so that you can engage with the messages later on. And one of the things that we were really heartened to see and hear during that last counting session that I mentioned earlier was that people were saying how beneficial they found the recordings so that they could engage with the messaging either as part of their own professional development a wee bit later on beyond the session. But more importantly, some people were sharing the messages with their peers across their establishments, and that really generated some of that professional discussion and dialogue beyond the sessions. And people were able to take the high level messages from the counting series and think about what that meant for them and their current position in the context that they were working with. Um, so uh, we get great feedback from that. So we will be repeating that and making sure that you all get a copy of the recording and we'll explain in a wee bit um, later on how you can access that recording. So we'll share that with you in a, a second or two. And as you know, Teams and technology in general can be a bit temperamental at times. So if for any reason you lose the slides or the sound, if you use the red leave button and rejoin, it normally does um, provide the fix um, to get you back online. Hopefully that will save any uh, further disruption. So with that in mind, I'm going to put my camera off just to protect the bandwidth too. Next slide, please, Yvonne. Thank you. OK, it wasn't moving on for me there, so I don't know if I'm a wee bit, um, so there's a wee bit of a lag, but that's me up to date now. So we want to ensure that the sessions that we provide are inclusive and as accessible as possible. And as you can see from the slide, Teams has some really useful accessibility options. For example, Teams can detect what's said in a meeting and present that in terms of real time, real -time captions. Live captioning provides everybody with an equal opportunity to access and enjoy the webinar experience, and you can control that via your meeting controls on your um, device. So to use live captions in a meeting, if you go to your meeting controls and at the top of the screen, select more and then settings, you'll be given an option there to turn on or off live captions. And it's really helpful if you're still working or you're in a loud environment because you'll still be able to follow what's been said in the presentation, so it's really useful. You can also select the full screen option so that it maximises the presentation for you. And again, you'll find this by clicking the view option and then more and then selecting full screen. And by doing so, that will expand the view to full screen and hide the title bar and the task bar, which allows you to focus on the presentation in its fullest form. It is worth familiarising yourself with the many accessibility um, options offered within Teams because it really can make a difference to the webinar experience. So if you're not familiar with it, it's definitely worth taking a bit of time just to familiarise yourself with those options. 
OK, on the next slide, we're going to do a wee bit of a connector. We'd like to start off with just a bit of a gentle introduction. And what we thought um, for this one, we would like you to think of a place that's special to you. So it could be a place that you have fond memories of. It could be just a place that you really like to visit. It could be, be a place of significant um, memories with, for you and your family, something that's a special place that means something to you. If you can just pop it into the chat pane and tell us why. And again, if you want to use the Padlet, there'll be a place in the Padlet as well that you can just tell us where is your special place, share your thoughts and tell us why. And I'll just pause for a second to get, allow you to do that. I'm seeing beaches mentioned quite a few times, which um, fills my heart with joy. I'm just back from a beach holiday, so yep. Oh, mum's got family, yep. I love that one, Granny's House, where everybody comes together. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, and somebody had a proposal in Lanzarote, so obviously that's a, a special place for them. Lovely. Oh, lots of nice exotic places here and a few places closer to home as well. Fantastic. Lots of mention of marriage here, which actually brings me quite nicely on to when we move on to the next slide. But yeah, thank you so much for engaging with that. Lots of great memories there for us to reflect on. So thank you for sharing. Yvonne and I were quite keen that we shared a little bit about us in terms of our personal interest and things that we like to do when we're not working. So this is me, Maria Doherty, and you'll see there um, and you'll see when Yvonne puts her pictures up that both Yvonne and I are dog moms. We both have um, dogs that take up a lot of our time and energy, but that we love dearly. So you'll see a picture of my buddy there, who um, is my constant companion. I don't think I go many places without buddy. And you'll also see wedding rings, which brings me back to people talking about honeymoons and, and weddings. There's two reasons that's on my slide just now. And one is that my daughter is going to be married next year. So we are in the moment as a family deeply engrossed in all things wedding. But it's also my husband and I's wedding anniversary tomorrow. And we'll be celebrating 32 years married. So an award I hope is coming my way. But yeah, that's quite a significant one for me. And you'll also see there a suitcase because I do love to travel. Um, I'm just back, as I said, from a beach holiday, which was amazing. And if I'm at home and I'm looking for something nice to do, it's the theatre for me. There's nothing better, in my opinion, than a night at the theatre. So that's a wee bit about me. And I'll pass over just now to Yvonne to share a wee bit about herself. Thank you. Yours seems so much more exciting than me, Maria. So <laughs> I've got two pictures there. You can see uh, that is me. And as Maria said, I'm also dog mum to Marley. Um, and in our spare time away from work, we are therapeutic volunteers. So we go out and about visiting different places like hospitals, the children's hospital, care homes, um, bringing a little bit of happiness and a bit of cheering up to staff and uh, patients alike. And we are about to start visiting in some schools as well because we've just started our um, children's visiting and if I'm not out and about with Marley then I am usually found in the kitchen baking. Um, it was a hobby that got out of control during the lockdown period as my family refer to it so um, yeah quite a lot of baking goes on and, and the maths team will attest to having tasted many of these and, and often being my guinea pigs of trying new recipes. Um, so yeah just a wee bit about me there. And I'll hand back to you, Maria. Thank you, Yvonne. And yes, I can absolutely um, test, be testament to the fact that your cakes are on a different level, I have to say. So we're always very keen to meet in person because Yvonne often gifts us with the out endless hours that she spends in her kitchen providing lots of goodies for us. So thank you, Yvonne. And again, um, we are aware, and because we ran those sessions last year as well in terms of the counting series, we're very aware that the people who are signing up and attending the webinar sessions come from a variety of backgrounds with quite similar, but also sometimes quite unique roles. And we have tried throughout this session and the last session to accommodate for the many people represented here tonight. But as you can see from the slide, it's quite a task. It's not as easy as you would, you would imagine. 
it would be really helpful for us to know which of these roles that you see on the slide just now best describe your current kind of situation. Describe what current situation? Oh, what? I seem to be on loudspeaker now. Seem to have a bit of an echo. Oh, that's fine. I think that's because somebody was just joining. So it would be really useful for us if we could find out in particular what role you come to us with tonight. So we've, we're going to share with you in the next slide or two a, a Microsoft forum. And it would be really good for us to find out exactly what role you um, you come to us tonight. So that's just a wee bit of an explanation about why we've added that into the, the e-forum. The last thing I wanted to say really on this slide is, should there be any further questions, comments or bespoke um, additional support required? We put our contact details on that first slide and you'll get a copy of the presentation to access that um, contact information. And we would be happy to engage further if it would be helpful. So it's really just to say that we are trying to accommodate for the many roles that come. But if there is anything bespoke, then please get in touch with us. We're just going to share the, the aims with you now. And we've got three main aims that we're looking to try and achieve tonight. Initially, what we're, we're think we want to do is we want to think about the spaces, interactions and experiences and how we ensure that they are numer numeracy rich. And by making small tweaks and small additions, how do we, we, we can ensure that those um, spaces, interactions and experiences are indeed uh, numeracy rich. Yvonne and I also do a lot of reading and research and we look at national guidance and I'll talk a wee bit more about that on the next slide. And we try and make sure that the messages that we share with you tonight are in line with some of those national messages and that wider research that we do. But the most important one, I think, is the, the final one, the third one on that list. And again, this comes through really strongly from the last sessions that we delivered, where people really valued that opportunity to come together and have that time and space to just reflect on their own current practice. And that might be individually and thinking about those high level messages and where they are in terms of their own development but also to share that wider um, back at their establishments and they really like that opportunity to take some of those national messages back and have those conversations. So there'll be lots of opportunities throughout tonight where we'll say to you, have a think about this, reflect on this. And we don't just mean within the session, we're talking about that wider reflection in terms of taking those messages back and thinking about them either on your own or indeed with your peers back at your establishments. So that's what we're hoping to achieve tonight. And I mentioned um, earlier on just there about finding out who you are and the fact that we've got a Microsoft forum that we would like just to take a few minutes to tell us who you are and where, where you're from. So you'll see the QR code on the slide just now and I'm going to pause again just to let you fill that in. It's not an onerous form at all. There's only a few questions. Um, if you don't mind filling that in for us just to tell us who you are, what role um, you hold and we'll come back together just in about two minutes. So sorry for unmuting. I, no, can't okay. I can't access my chat and I'm attending the meeting through my phone. So I can't actually get um, access to QR code either. Uh, so, OK, so what we can do is when we the events team will send you out a copy of the slides, we fabulous. can make sure that they send you this out so you can fill it. So you'll just have Thank to you. imagine where you are just now and, and don't <laughs> fill it in <laughs> having okay. already listened to session one. Thank you. Thank you. Back on mute. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, a couple of people saying there that they can't get it to work. No problem if yeah, you can't. Thank you. Um, we will we'll send that out with the slides so that you can access it. Thank you. Thank Thank you. Bye.
Okay, well, we'll move on, Yvonne. And as Yvonne said, if you can't access that just now, you will get an opportunity to do so. There's a few people saying they can't access the QR code. So don't worry, you will get access to it when the, the slides and everything come your way. So we'll move on just now. Thank you. So as I mentioned earlier on, um, Yvonne and I do a lot of research and that would be the same case for all the professional learning that we offer as a team. We make sure it's research informed and it meets the requirements outlined in some national documentation, some of which are highlighted on the screen just now. We make sure we spend time familiarising ourselves with the latest and most up to date guidance to make sure our messaging is online and in line with other doc uh, national documentation. And we also do intensive personal research that really supports the messages we deliver. So it was, you'll be familiar with some of these, but it's just really to raise that awareness that everything that we do, there's been quite a bit of work in, in reading and research put into it before we come to the point of even delivering um, the presentation. So we've looked far and wide um, at, to make sure that everything is, is in line with other documentation that you will probably be familiar with. Next slide, Yvonne. Thank you. So what you'll see on the slide just now is a Padlet. And if you attended the sessions last session, we provided a Padlet for all the counting um, webinars that we delivered. And again, that was really valuable. People really liked the idea of having everything in the one place and everything included a copy of the presentation, the slides, the recording of the, the presentation and any external links or things that we referred to throughout the session. We put it all onto a Padlet and kept it in one place. And because of that, we've done exactly the same for this session. So you'll see it's looking quite empty just now because this is obviously session one. But as the sessions go on, the Padlet will become quite populated by you know the, the presentations and all those links. So it's quite a handy guide just to keep keep it keep this handy so that you can access it and you'll get access to everything that we talk about throughout the sessions. So I've put a link into the the chat there so that you've got that. But again you will get access to the slides. I see somebody's having some problems with the slides. Oh just to leave and rejoin. Thanks, Yvonne. So we're going to pause um, at the next one. I did say as part of the aims, we were going to give you time to do a bit of kind of pause and reflect. And we would like you to put into the chat and consider these two questions. And again, if you can't get to the chat, hopefully you can use the QR code to access the Padlet. Or, or just think about it if you can't access either. If you do just a wee bit of thought on your own um, in terms of these two questions, what do you think is meant by a numeracy rich environment? And what are the benefits of a numeracy rich environment? So why have we put this webinar on and why do you think it's important? So again, I'm going to pause just to allow you to think about that and put some comments into the chat if you can, or indeed the Padlet if you can. If you can't access the chat, don't worry about it. I see if somebody's put into the, the chat there that they can't see the chat and it's not updating. Just have a wee think about it on your own. And again, this might be a question that you go beyond tonight's session and have a deeper thought about and maybe a discussion back at your establishment. So don't worry, just take a bit of time to think. Yep, lots of good stuff coming through the paddle and the chat. So thank you to everyone who's contributing. Mention of number sense in that space for looking at daily route building into daily routines and thinking about the world around them, that real life context. Yep. Great stuff. So keep these ideas coming and I'll just offer a few of my own reflections just whilst the chat and the, the Padlet are being populated. 
though effective rich environments facilitate children learning in context and we've had lots of that coming through the chat which is great and can provide those opportunities for all learners to think to explore to investigate and question and we know these are so important and that maths talk really equips our children with the tools to make their learning visible. So again, what we need to try and provide is lots of opportunities to gather what's going on in their heads. What are they thinking? What are they grappling with? Essentially, what we want to do is encourage children to see maths in their everyday interactions and experiences and in the world around them. And that's coming through really strongly in what people are posting into the chat in the Padlet. We know that a child's numeracy experience is enriched by the people and the physical environment around him or her. And a numeracy rich environment emphasises the importance of using materials and interactions which facilitate numer numeracy and mathematical opportunities. It's important because it equips our children with the tools and the resources they need to become problem solvers and effective problem solvers and effective thinkers. And by being immersed in an environment that fosters a positive mindset surrounding maths, children become unafraid of making mistakes and taking risks. And we know that this is essential, particularly in this subject area. We're hoping that all of that said and everything that you've put into the Padlet and to the chat, that this could lead to higher levels of confidence and increased engagement levels. And again, when we think about a numeracy rich environment, we could think about it in terms of what does the physical environment offer? And when we consider the physical environment, it's important to consider the actual building, indoors and outdoors, the grounds, the surrounding area, and then within the building, the physical environment includes the hallways, the setup, the seating, the displays, the storage, all of that external stuff that surrounds yeah. um, is, is important too. And also the tools and resources that the children would need to become mathematical thinkers. But we can also think about the cultural environment too. And when we consider the cultural environment, we're thinking about the ethos and a positive, a positive climate for developing and learning. And again, it's worth again pausing and reflecting how are we promoting this and ensuring the importance of mathematics is shared and promoted across our establishments. And that could be with peers and families, but also with our children. The cultural environment should encourage the development of productive dispositions for numeracy and maths by creating a safe environment for children to be agents in their own learning. I've mentioned taking risks before and that's important. They need to learn from their mistakes and they need to engage in that productive maths talk that I spoke about. And what we're hoping to do um, is look at our spaces, experiences and interactions and ways that you can do that. So I'm going to pass to Yvonne just now. Over to you, Yvonne. Thank you. So yeah, as Maria has been saying, um, we think that this um, graphic which comes from Realising the Ambition really kind of sums up what we mean by numeracy rich environment. We know that actually the environment is, is not just the playroom or the classroom or the setting or the outdoor setting that's the space but actually we also need to be thinking about our our, our interactions with children numeracy rich and are the experiences that we are building on from their interests and also the ones that we are providing are they numeracy rich as well so you often hear people just talking about the environment and they just mean the physical space um so as we go through tonight we will talk a little bit about making your space numeracy rich but we're all also going to talk about interactions and experiences because we know that that is a key part of a successful environment is the human and social environment of the positive nurturing interactions and also that the experiences are part of your environment we know that children need to learn things for themselves but it doesn't mean that they're always doing it by themselves we can learn and follow and build on their motivations and their interests and um, helping our young people to make the most of the environment for their learning and development. We also know that from realising the ambition and apologies, those of you that are in an ELC setting are probably very, very well versed in this. But we know that um, from speaking to the likes of those that are maybe in primary, they're not as familiar with this. Um, but really, realising the ambition says that we need to be confident that we are promoting a happy, 
interesting and empowering learning environment, considering the interactions, experiences and spaces on offer and thinking about what do we as practitioners add value to what the children already know and what they can already do. So as we go through the presentation tonight, we're going to highlight some of the ways that you can do that within your setting. This is another kind of key quote for us that comes from realising the ambition and it was really great to see a lot of people mentioning that in their comments, um, that it's not just about having maths in one place within your setting. Many of you might have a dedicated storage space or an area where your numeracy maths resources are kind of explicitly held or explicitly stored, but it's much more than that. It's about permeating numeracy and maths across your setting indoors and outdoors and so tonight that's the kind of things that we're going to be talking about we often talk about thinking about making our environment literacy rich and I don't know if we give as much um, of a thought to making it numeracy rich so again hopefully as you go through tonight you realize that actually there's lots that you are doing within your setting and then there's maybe one or two ideas that you can take away um, and once you get the slides we've included things like this and um, some reflective questions where you can actually use this to look at your current setting and consider things like, do you have a mixture of typed and handwritten numerals? Are there a mixture of ones that adults have created, but also ones that your children have created? Um, things like, are maths resources given a high profile? Can the children freely transport things into their play that, that are maybe more traditionally maths thought of things? Are there, um, as Maria was saying, you know, do you have visuals that encourage things like matching and sorting during tidying up? And we'll show you some examples in a minute. Where you've got numerals on display, are they always shown horizontally? Do you have any numerals that are displayed vertically? Because again, it's really important as, as children begin to understand about number lines that they see number lines that are displayed in both types of ways. Um, and, you know, again, things like your block and construction area, how have you got that sorted? So I'll hand over to Maria, who's going to talk to you a little bit more and share some examples that we've got. Thank you, Yvonne. So, yeah, shown in the slide just now is just a few examples of how to try to incorporate aspects of numeracy and maths into our spaces. And it could be simply the addition of a digit card or the number in the number name or the, some visual clues. These types of things are actually quite easy to, to add in and embed, but it actually gives the children that idea of seeing the number two, for example, represented in lots of different ways. And you'll see that you, we've got the numicon there and we've got actually got that in, in pennies as well. So it's just about how can we extend and make sure that that's in, embedded. We also know that some visual clues, and you'll see some of that on the slide just now, um, allows the children to sort and match, as well as develop an understanding of number and quantity. So again, it's just about how can we think about some simple additions that are quite easily done to ensure numeracy and math permeates our spaces and children are becoming immersed in that mathematical thinking. And we know that it mentions in that first picture there on the top right hand side about using those real life contexts. That's been mentioned throughout the, the chat and the Padlet already. And that's because we know children are more likely to retain information and remember it if what they're learning is linked to real life context. So again, it's worth considering and reflecting how do our spaces reflect that and what simple additions could we add to maybe make sure that that's more prominent. It's also maybe worth considering an audit. And again, this is something that we, we took from the counting series last year where people were saying, I'm going to take that wee aspect of what you've said to me, take it back to my establishment and think about are the resources, for example, across our spaces freely available? Can they be accessed quite easily by our learners? And do they provide lots of opportunities for the children to make decisions and do problem solving and, and deepen that engagement and that thinking? So it's worth, and a couple of the, the practitioners from my own local authority had come back to me to say, I went back to my establishment after some of the inputs and looked at it more through the children's lens, at the children's level, the children's height, and I was able to see that I could make slight changes. And again, just by adding the numicon or the digit name or a dot pattern to some of the stuff that you've got will actually just allow you to 
to see what the children know and understand and what additions and support you might need to add. So that's just some ideas about things that you could do. And uh, on the next slide, it's, it's important that we consider, and Yvonne's mentioned earlier, and I'll mention it a few times too, that when we're talking about spaces, it's the both the indoors and the outdoors that, that we're considering. And it's about that, that outdoor space being able to extend and consolidate um, the, the children's learning and providing open-ended materials, some of which you'll see on the slide just now, they really offer that potential for those creative explorations. And again, that could be through child-initiated, but also adult-initiated learning experiences. Our spaces should be planned to provide that balance of opportunities so that learners can play, they can explore, they can question, they can investigate. And that's really this richness of these open-ended materials will allow the children to do that. So again, just some ideas on the slide just now about ways that you could provide some um, spaces so that the children are able to try and, you know, just question and explore a wee bit more fully. And we know on the next slide that developing, and somebody mentioned this actually in the chat about number sense, we know developing a strong sense of early number is essential because it lays the foundation for children to become fluent and confident mathematicians in their later years. And here, we're, I'm just thinking some about some of the concrete manipulatives that you might have access to across your setting and how these can be added to your current spaces to really embed that mathematical thinking and that investigation that I've mentioned. So a couple of examples of ways that you could do that. During registration, for example, children might self-register by placing their picture on a 10 frame. And then practitioners can then discuss bonds to 10, for example. How many more people would we need to fill this frame? How many do you see altogether? How many more? How many less? We could also think about the composition of numbers beyond 10. So we could have two full 10 frames and maybe three more. And with the children, we could be counting 10, 20, and then 21, 22, 23. And that way, the children are getting exposed to how numbers are made up. Again, it's snack time, an adult might not have enough fruit, for example, and they might ask the children how many more do we need to make sure that everybody's got um, some fruit, or they might be matching the straws with the milk and notice that they have the same or equal, and it's all that opportunity there for that mathematical language and context that, that makes sense. The children might be encouraged to put three toys in each basket when they're tidying up, or they might use a linear calendar to count how many days until a big event or the weekend or something that's happening across the establishment. And the some of the manipulative that you see on the slide just now should support these conversations with the children. And the children may then want to use things like counters or blocks or the wreck and wreck that you see to support their thinking or demonstrate their understanding out with that particular snack or registration. So it's about how we make these accessible to the children in the moment, but also accessible so that the children can dabble with them and explore and investigate them out with that moment too. Next slide, Yvonne. Thank you. So as we've said, our spaces should be numerated rich and have mathematical language, resources and books um, related to all aspects of numeracy. The resources provided should promote that inquiry and investigation that I've been talking about. And really what we're trying to promote is that problem solving approach throughout all the, the, the interactions that, that we offer. In relation to time, teaching time, we can provide lots of objects and displays which can really help develop that concept and that awareness of time. So, for example, our spaces could have timers or small clocks, stopwatches and calendars, open and closing times, maybe on a shop or a post office or a cafe. Old timing devices are quite useful as well, and they would be um, a helpful addition to some of your spaces and made available to learners because they can then tinker with them and it would promote that, and curios that curiosity um, that we want in our children. A range of calendars and charts and diaries can also spark curiosity and encourage that playful interaction. Visual timetables, where appropriate, can be used to illustrate now and next, but they can also support learners to sequence events in chronological order using some of that language that can be quite abstract for learners. So they might talk about something that's happening before or after or next or today or later. So you know all that type, that type of language, but if we're doing that in context, it really provides the learners with that visual clue, which makes it easier for them to recall as it should start to build a picture in their minds. 
So again, it, it's worthwhile taking time to consider how we can take advantage of what's in our indoor and our outdoor settings that we can use to explore um, mathematical thinking. And thinking about outdoors, we'll talk a lot more about outdoors in our, our next session. But in terms of teaching time, it's worthwhile thinking, what do we have in our outdoor settings that the children can experience time and the seasons? So we're getting into that time of year now where we're changing seasons. So it might be a good um, opportunity for, for us to think about what do we have there in terms of our outdoor space that would encourage that mathematical thinking, not just related to teaching time, but a bit wider than that. And we've said it a few times um, that children who see the relevance of what they're learning and the usefulness and how they can apply that, these ideas beyond the setting are more likely to engage. And we believe that the context provided can spark or ignite a passion and curiosity for further teaching and learning. Therefore, it's about how we encourage that creativity. And Yvonne and I will be offering the third session of this series, really looking at that curiosity and creativity. But we know that this context creates a reason to develop mathematical knowledge and skills and emergent opportunities for explicit teaching of mathematical concepts. It helps children to identify how and where mathematics might be used and applied and how various calculations and procedures can be used to explain and support real world problems and decisions. So it's about using our spaces, our interactions and experiences as opportunities to develop children's understanding of mathematics and asking questions that stimulate and extend the thinking and understanding of numbers, shape, measure, etc. And I'll mention in the next slide a wee bit more about outdoors, but as I said, our next session or session two, we'll look at maths outdoors in much more detail. But as we do begin to think about developing maths outdoors, we need to reflect on the math experiences we provide indoors and think of ways to extend them outdoors, complementing and enhancing indoor provision and celebrating the unique qualities of the outdoor environment so that we are providing stimulating spaces with enriched areas of provision. So this may include exploring empty and full containers, using sand or, or water, gathering, sorting and counting pebbles or twigs or branches and stones, they could be investigating measure, looking at tiny seeds, measuring the height of runner bean plants or tall sunflowers. So again, it's worthwhile taking this away and thinking about how you're currently using your space to ensure the uh, development of numeracy and maths across your setting. And I'm going to pass to Yvonne just now, who's going to take us through some thoughts in connection with our interactions. Thank you. So yes, um, Maria was talking about that sort of cultural environment. I think that ties in quite nicely with the, the first couple of slides that we've got, which are around actually our own mathematical mindset. We know from making maths count that it was identified that lots of people in Scotland are quite happy to kind of label themselves as being bad at maths. And, you know, you'll, you'll often still hear people say, or, oh, you know, don't ask me, you know, I don't want to split the bill. I'm rubbish at maths and you know when you're talking with families you'll hear them saying things like oh well yeah I was always rubbish at maths and actually part of thinking about your numeracy rich environment is actually thinking about your own staff context so we know some of you your child minders it may well just be you yourself that that is there with other you you've maybe got a bigger job because you've maybe got a bigger staff team and we know that people have very different experiences of maths. So for some of you, you will have had a very positive experience of maths at school. You love maths. You love engaging the children with maths. Others, you might have not had such a great experience of maths yourself, but you're determined to make sure that the children you're working with don't feel the way that you do. So, you know, you very much do take the time to link it to real life concepts, to make sure it's relevant. Um, and then for some of you uh, or colleagues that you work with, they will have had a very negative experience of maths and that will still be with them. Um, you know, and you may even know of people or you yourself who um, suffer from maths anxiety, you might have had to call 
colleagues who didn't want to engage in this training because actually the fact that it was labelled as something to do with maths is enough for them to kind of have an, an excuse and not want to take part. So it's really important to consider actually what culture do you have around maths in your setting? When you're using maths yourself in your job, is it spoken about positively or do you hear people grumble like, oh, I'm away to do the snack order or oh, I hate adding it up every week or oh, I hate it. You know, do we have that which actually children are then picking up on? Um, you know, when you're looking at data together, do you have some members of your staff who are maybe much quieter around data because actually they're having a harder time understanding it because their own math skills are not as strong? Um, what? What support do you have if you do have a member of staff that, that wants to improve? And seeing somebody in the chat there saying, went back to get my nap five at the age of 42. You know, it's amazing what people can have the confidence to go on and do. Um, I'm always reminded of an experience um, a number of years ago when I was working in a, an early year setting and we were with children who were playing in the block area and they were asking about the different shapes and afterwards kind of reflecting with the member of staff that, you know, that was a real opportunity where we could have been using a lot of mathematical language and that practitioner hadn't used an awful lot. Um, and sh she was very honest and she said, can I, can I be honest with you, Yvonne? Um, I, I don't use the names of the blocks in the block area because I don't know what they are. And I said, oh, you must do, like you will know what some of them are. And so it turns out that a few years before um, she had incorrectly identified a, a triangular prism and another member of staff in the setting had shouted across in front of the children, that's not a triangular prism. And that interaction alone had just put her off from ever engaging with the maths um, and ever wanting to kind of have the confidence to use that language again. So kind of first of all, it's about thinking about actually how are your own interactions with each other affecting your numeracy rich environment? It's then also about thinking when you're engaging with the children. Um, you know, as Maria has spoken about and as we'll talk about more in session three, we really want to be promoting that curiosity and that creativity in the questions that we are asking. So, you know, I wonder what will happen and what do you notice and what's going to happen if so that they're getting excited about trying things out and investigating things. Also, we want to make sure that we're not causing misconceptions. So like, some of the things on the slide. So, for example, you might have caught yourself saying, oh, three take away five. Oh, we can't do that. Now, actually, you can do three take away five. It gives you a negative number. You're probably not going to be exploring that as much with children at early level, but you don't want to say we can't do that because it then creates a misconception that that it's not a possible thing to do. Often things uh, you hear people saying, oh, right, who wants the bigger half? And again, there is no such thing as a bigger half because halves are equal. So if there's one that's bigger than the other, you have not cut it in half. Um, one that I was so bad at saying to children, oh, yep, I'll be there. I'll be, I'll be there. Give me a wee minute. I'll be there in a wee minute. And I look back and I think, what what on earth is a wee minute? You know, what, what does that teach them? Because a minute, <laughs> there's no we or big about it. Wee minute, it's 60 seconds. So actually, I'll be there in one minute. I'll be there in five minutes. Telling them that I'll be there in a wee minute. You know, it's not really helping anything there. Um, one that still causes controversy within our team will be there at the back of 11. People in our team are arriving at all different times. Some are arriving just before 11 because the hand's at the back of the 11. Some people will be turning up just after 11 o'clock. So between kind of five past 11 and quarter past 11. So again, some of the terms that we use um, are not, understood in the same way as everybody else and also thinking about how we portray math so you know making sure that that staff are not talking about math negatively that it's really hard um, or that they're really bad and picking up adults and families as well you know yeah maths is hard but it's really important um, so kind of thinking about how we're talking about maths 
on the the next couple of slides, um, we've got some time for you to kind of think about your own interactions. We know that learning through play requires that skillful interaction and conversation in environments because it helps to support and extend children's thinking and actions. It requires adults who are both playful but also knowledgeable of the building blocks of early development and learning in order to support and progress the learning appropriately. And we know um, th the role of an adult in early um, learning and childcare is such a delicate balance because it's about supporting and enriching and proposing on one hand, but it's also about giving children the space and the time to build their own ideas and lead off of one another. So we need to value their play, take time to observe and learn about what they are doing, but also we need to be making sure that we are extending their learning. So stepping back and noticing what the children are involved in is a skill that needs to be embedded into practice um, in both our early learning and childcare settings, but also in our school settings. We need to reflect on the learning of the child so that we can facilitate the provocation or a further response to allow them to pursue their own thinking. And that also allows further time for us to capture what their thinking is prior to interacting and then developing a plan for building or extending on their thinking. And it's quite tricky to get that balance right. Um, and I think even the most experienced of practitioners will tell you that getting the balance right between child initiated, adult initiated and adult directed experience it is a tricky one. It depends on the uniqueness of the needs of the setting, of the children, of the wider context, of cultural environments and of the way that your children learn and play. So on this slide here, um, we've popped the balance and scales in the middle because when Maria and I were talking about this, we were saying we often feel it's that balance and act between you're not wanting to kind of intrude and take over the play, but at times the very nature of being an educator sparks that in you that actually you want to ask them a question or you want to explore that misconception a bit further. So we'd just like you to have a read through these and just think, is there one or two that really jump in and you think, oh, that that's me um, or actually I need to do more of that or that's a focus for us this year. Um, and if you've got any thoughts, if you're drawn to a particular one, you can either pop it into the chat um, or if you can't see the chat the the padlet that Maria had been posted the, that's on the QR code so I'm going to stop talking for a minute or two and just give you time to think about your own interactions um, as you go through. Maria, are you seeing anything coming in on the chat there? No, Yvonne, I am not. Nope. I know that some people are watching this with colleagues, so you're maybe kind of having yeah. a chat together as well. Um, Maria, I don't know if there was any There's... that kind of stood out for you as, as you read them. Um, let me have a think. I think for me, I was always very guilty of um 
try that balance between not wanting to take over but not wanting to let a moment go and so children would maybe invite me to play alongside them and find myself almost biting my tongue to not be like oh can you bring me four plates and oh how many more and because they'd invited me into their world just being sensitive that I then wasn't taking over with my agenda I think that was something that that I certainly had to to work with and often reflecting back thinking should I have intervened particularly if I saw a misconception developing if I'd stopped and said well, actually, you've not got five there. Let's try again and count it. Would it have gone in a different direction? So again, that balance between taking over, but actually, are there some things when I maybe should take over? Um, yeah, I would agree. And I think a few people now are saying that in the chat in the Padlet. It's that fine line between involving yourself and holding back to allow the play to unfold naturally through what the children say and do. And I've got it wrong so many times. Um, and I, th I think a few people are saying the same. It's actually really tricky um, to get that right. And I do the same. Tracy has just put sometimes asking too many questions. Yeah, guilty of that too. <laughs> As opposed to thinking about the questions that I want to ask that are more open-ended, that allow the children to bring quite a lot to the, the discussion too, rather than almost the balance being wrong and me taking over. Yeah, and a few people saying, you know, sometimes overthinking it, um, sometimes misreading where you think the children do want you to join in, but then you start and it, they all go very quiet as if, like, why is she joining in? Um, so, yeah, it's good to to see that it's not just us, Maria, that, um, you know, it, it, it is that balance. Um, yeah. So on the next couple of slides, we have pulled... Um, Things that have come from the development and research in early mathematics education page, or um, as you can see, they've got their nice short snappy acronym down there. Um, so basically, it's a network of researchers from across America who collaborate on maths teaching and learning in the early years. So although it's American, it is actually really useful because it's something that focuses very much on the early mathematics mathematical development. Um, so we know that children build their math skills during specific maths things. You know, we know, for example, if we're playing a board game with a dice, that's going to be helping them counting and, and supertizing. But it's actually about thinking about the interactions that go on across the day in the everyday routines and transitions. And part of what they have on their website is actually showing what they call the maths moment. Um, so they have categorised them into five different times of the day. So they talk about clean up time, on the go, so when you're kind of moving around or different places in the setting, at meal times, um, and again, diff for different settings that will look different. Some of you are offering breakfast, lunch, dinner. Some of you it's a snack. Um, some of you it's a play time if you're in primary one and fruit, things like that. Um, and then they talk about ones that are any time, but actually you can use them quite flexibly. And we know that with support, we can use our interactions carefully to use these brief little moments of learning to help boost children's maths development. And the good thing about them is the examples can be used with an individual child or it can be the kind of thing that can be used um, with a group. And they're also quite good for maybe adapting and sharing with parents as well, because, again, a lot of parents know that reading with their child, reading aloud to their child helps the literacy development, but a lot of them are not as confident developing the early math skills. So the kind of things that they can be doing at dinner time when they're tidying up, things like that, you know, when they're sorting the washing. So this example here, it talks about at meal times how you can reinforce the understanding of skills and counting of cardinality. And if you don't know what that word means, I suggest you go and check out the counting series from last year. Um, and also of numbers and, and understanding what numbers mean. It gives the adult maybe the chance to count out loud um, and for the child to hear that or to count alongside you. It also might allow you to explore things like more, most, none, equal. So again, mathematical words that could be brought in during maths time. 
this example here is about kind of tidying up um, and again it's talking about that understanding of counting a number so it might be that as it suggests in the example you're simply counting the, the things as, as they're being put away but also you might be bringing in that comparison of language so things like more most home oh, i can see maria's got lots of bricks oh i see yvonne she's got no bricks um, and again, modelling, counting, possibly counting forwards, counting backwards. Let's put these bricks away. Ten, nine, eight. We've got no bricks left. So again, just that opportunity for children to hear you model, hear you counting out loud for a purpose. Again, I'm sure there's lots of times across different times of the day where you're using music. So this is an example of how interactions can help reinforce that understanding of measure and also of counting in time. So you might use music to count in time to the beat to model things like fast and slow, up and down. It might be that you're using it for positional language, so things like in front and behind, let's clap in front, let's clap behind, forwards and backwards, let's clap above our, our heads, let's clap below our legs, lots of positional language that can be used. Also ordinal language, so you might be saying like first we're going to clap, second we're going to stomp, um, and also it can, this can be be a good way of reinforcing abstraction another word for from our counting series last year where actually being able to count things like clapping and stomping and waving our hands is an intangible object we can't hold the clap or hold the stomp in our hands so it's a it's a trickier thing to be able to count and these kind of activities where you're using movement and music can help to reinforce counting abstract things on the next couple of slides, just going to show you some examples um, that Maria and I have. So in this example, the tough tree was actually set up. Initially, it just had lots of different colourful items on it. And this was used to reinforce colour matching and fine motor skills. And it had been set up in the setting following an interest in storybooks about colour. So I think, you know, they were reading things like Elmer um, and um, I forget the other one that's got all the different colourful people in it. Um, the crayons quit, things like that. The children had been enjoying those stories about colour. And so the staff had kind of set that up on the back of there being an interest in colour. But actually, through their interactions, the staff began to notice that children were counting the pom poms. So they were using language like, I've got more, or you've got the most, or I've got lots and none. It was also noted through one of the observations that there was a misconception around that conservation of numbers. So um, one of the observations read that Sarah had five small pink pom poms on her, on her plate and Zach had three of the largest pom poms and Zach had said that he had the mostest because they're the biggest. So during that interaction, some time was spent actually counting the different sizes of pom poms. So counting Sarah's five small pom poms and five big pom poms and then three small ones and three big ones. So there was time spent comparing the different sizes and amounts and working out what does that mean? So kind of based on these interactions, the staff then decided that they would add the numeral cards that you can see in the picture here, just to see how the play would be extended by adding that into something that was existing already. Um, they then noticed that the addition of those numeral cards then led them on to a lot of children were doing things like making orders. Um, so it became almost like a sort of cafe or a restaurant and the pom poms were like the cakes and the biscuits, which then allowed the interactions to continue around, oh, who's got the most cakes out going out the kitchen? And oh, how many more biscuits are you going to need to have six? and well, if your customer wants three more how are you going to have now so again just by adding those numeral cards and kind of watching what happened it then meant that the interactions could take a slightly more mathematical route because children became interested in it 
The other things that they kind of spoke about, um, adding chalk, would that encourage mark making? Um, and also adding different sizes of items. Again, staff had noticed that that um, conservation of number wasn't necessarily being understood. Children thinking that because it's the biggest, it's the most. So they began to sort of look around the set and thinking actually, what do they have available in different sizes that they could reinforce the conservation of number in different places in the setting? So again, you can see kind of how the interaction from one little bit of their setting then kind of sparked different mathematical interactions in other places. So if you joined us in the last session, you might have remembered that there was a, a question that came up saying um, that somebody didn't understand how an obstacle course could ever be used in a mathematical way. So there's over 500 of you on the call. So we're going to set you this challenge. So in this example, a group of children had set out the obstacle course using some of the large construction items that were available. So we'd like you just to have a minute and think about if this is what was set up, how could you possibly use either your questioning or mathematical language or things that you might model using in your interactions to make this more numeracy rich? So I'm going to pause again. And again, if you can't see the chat, feel free to add them onto the Padlet. I'm loving some of the ideas that are coming into the chat. Um, so, yep, somebody's saying that you could number each part of it. So first, you've got to climb through the tires. Second, you've got to balance on the logs. Um, some people are saying timing. So again, you know, if you were to, for example, add a stopwatch nearby, would that make it more mathematical for the children? Would they begin to time each other? Could you model? using the timer that oh, I'm going to see how quick Missy Somerville can get round it. Right, can you get round faster than me? Um, people saying things linked to measuring tapes. So again, yep, children might be interested to actually find out how long things were or maybe how high, what's the tallest hurdle that they could jump over. Um, I'm trying to see, there's lots of things yet. People talking about the different shapes there. How many think, steps it takes them? Sorry, Maria, I cut you no, off there. No, it's OK. No, I was just going to say, I think it's that idea of some of the suggestions that are coming through, if this was taught in a more formal way, would be really abstract. So that idea of positional language and some of the language associated with measure, it can be quite abstract. But actually doing it in an activity or a provocation like this, the children are abs able to quite easily identify that word or that phrase or that concept with an experience. So it, it just makes it much more rich for them and it takes the abstractness away from some of the learning, which is which is difficult at times. But these are providing really effective ways of doing that. So, yeah, some great stuff coming through. Yeah, I, this is what I love about these sessions as well, because it's so many ideas. You know, Maria and I always chat about the things that we could say. But yeah, I mean, there's somebody saying that you could use tally marks to work out how many children have gone round it. Um, somebody was saying you can maybe make a leaderboard of who was first, second and third. And again, you know, thinking back to some of the children that I've worked with, they would be right up there, you know, roll up, roll up, come to the obstacle course, see how fast you can go round it. Your very own tough mudder right in your own setting. Um, so yeah, so many ideas. And what we try and do, if, if you weren't with us in the previous sessions, is we try and capture everything that's gone into the chat over onto the Padlet. So again, you can go back and look so that, you know, if you do happen to set up an obstacle course, then you've got some ideas there to help you with. 
Maria, I'm aware that we've talked for ages. I'm wondering if people need just maybe a couple of minutes to stretch yeah. their legs, um, take their shoulders away from the screen. So shall we maybe come back at 10 past? Sounds perfect. Yep. Hi, Rebecca. I see you've just put something into the chat there, there about accessing the recording. We're going to come to that again at the end, so don't worry if the, the, you joined late, but we're going to hold the recording, the presentation and all the links that we share on a Padlet and we'll share the link to the Padlet um, just towards the end of the presentation, so don't worry about it. Okay, so that's just about 10 past now. I think um, we'll get started just to go through the last couple of slides and the last little um, section we're going to look at is experiences. So we are aware of the critical importance of children's early experiences and how this will impact on their future development. What we're hoping to share with you is how to effectively recognise the significance of planning and providing high quality experiences and to understand how best to support and extend these experiences so that we are promoting children's learning and development. Young children, as we know, need stimulating first hand experiences and access to open ended opportunities, enriching experiences so that they can grow and develop a deep understanding about the world around them. Our job is to strive to maximise the positive experiences of children, which add value to what children already know and can do and are developmentally appropriate. And you'll see from the quotes on the slide that these high quality, rich experiences that I'm mentioning and I'm about to mention a bit more about are mentioned throughout Realising the Ambition and also in documents such as How Good Is Our Early Learning and Child Care and Care Inspectorate Guidance too. The next two slides are sort of reflective slides again, and these are ones that I would encourage you to come back to. Just now, just take a moment as I'm speaking to read and reflect on some of the statements that you see on the screen just now and be thinking about 
where are we really strong and where can we evidence that we're doing whatever part of that really well? And what evidence might we have um, to, to prove that? But where are there bits that we might need to develop a wee bit further? Where do we maybe need to as a staff team or it might be an individual thing? What might we need to look at and pay a wee bit more attention to? And again, be thinking about those everyday opportunities and, and what we plan to develop those experiences further so that they become really embedded into our practice. So again, I'll just pause for just a minute to let you look through some of those and do a wee bit of thinking and reflection on your own. But again, I would go back and share this with um, staff back at the, in my establishment too, just so that we've got that consistent approach and we're all thinking about it in the same way. OK, on the next slide, and we've mentioned this before, but we should be considering those um, experiences outdoors as well. And you can see that mentioned in some of the, the quotes there. It's about that wider environment and experience that we're talking about. But again, we will go through that in more detail at the next session. But it is worth considering and reflecting on how effectively we identify our strengths as professionals and as a wider setting to improve um, children's experiences and enhance progress and development, because that's what it's all about. And we know that um, practitioners are highly skilled at encouraging that curiosity and using effective questions, um, using comments that children make and using their observations to extend children's thinking and understanding. But what we would be saying is that it can be enhanced through the experiences that we plan and offer. Those should allow children to discuss and plan their learning and also allow them to enjoy success and share their achievements. Experiences should effectively take account of each child's needs, their dispositions, their interests and also their stage of development. Alongside that, we would be looking to promote children's creativity, extend their thinking, widen their skills and consolidate their learning. So as I said, it's working back to this slide and the previous slide, just to consider where we are at in terms of our own professional development and our, our um, wider setting and to think about potential areas of development. We've mentioned in some of these slides um, the power of stories and in the next slide, we'll talk about that in a wee bit more detail. So we know that children use stories to make sense of their world. And their brains become almost hardwired to respond to stories. And when I'm thinking about stories, it's, it's more than that. It's, it's rhymes and it's songs too. Because effective songs, stories or rhymes provide bite-sized learning opportunities for children to develop key developmental skills and can often be the trigger for hours and hours of creative and open-ended play. They can be used as a powerful, powerful sorry, vehicle to boost engagement and understanding of some abstract mathematical concepts, especially in the early years. They can help develop that familiarity with number and sounds and words in a way that it's really fun and interesting for young children. And if we think about carefully selecting songs or stories or rhymes um, that promote interest and understanding in number or counting or shape or measurement, we know that these are excellent vehicles for introducing some of that mathematical language that we've spoke about. And you'll see the mention on the slide to Scottish Book Trust and Math Through Story. These are particularly helpful websites that will give you a, a springboard if this isn't something that you've maybe engaged in as much as you would like. So definitely worth looking at Scottish Book Trust and Math Through Story. And over the next few slides, again, we're just hoping to highlight how the addition of just a few extra objects or resources can really ensure that your spaces, your interactions and your experiences can be numeracy rich. And it's about making those small tweaks or those additions that can, you can keep the same activity or the same provocation, but just develop it over time with the addition of just a few different things. So I'm going to talk through this one, but in the next two slides, I'm going to leave it over to you to add your comments, your thoughts and um, any thinking into the Padlet and uh, into the chat. So what you'll see in this image here is a, a mud kitchen. Mud kitchen play can spark an interest in natural loose parts and can be the first step to introducing new textures to children, but also broadening that vocabulary. Describing the textures, combining loose parts into mud pies and soups, can develop that, their imagination whilst they're having fun, but also deepening their understanding of some maths concepts. Mud for children is intriguing. Earth and water and how they interact is dead exciting for children. 
And some of us on the call just now might remember making something like mud pies and how much we thoroughly enjoyed it. It's no different for children. Mud is a material that really helps stimulate that creativity and imagination, and it helps facilitate some open-ended play. It can help develop communication and collaboration and also a bit of physical activity there too. But mud play in particular allows children to connect and interact with the natural world around them. Mud can support children's mathematical learning journey and help them to recognise numbers, learn about spaces, shapes and measurements. So, for example, they may, it might help them develop some of their learnings associated with counting. They might say one number for each object when they're counting the number of pots or dishes that they're fill, filling with mud. They might remember the pattern of the number sequence. They might begin to understand cardinality. So that last number, if they've counted four, indicates that that last number gives them the total. They might begin to use counting to solve practical problems by sharing out pots amongst a small group, for example. They might start talking about same and different, so they're de developing that understanding of comparison. They might describe the utensils using language of comparison like bigger, smaller, longer, wider, narrower. In connection with shape and space and measure, they might use everyday words and mathematical words to describe utensils or what they have made. So they might say, I want a round jar to make my mud pie. They might develop positional language. We've mentioned that before. So they might say, I want that pot and it's behind the spoons. They might use everyday words that, uh, to describe capacity and they might order them in, in order of empty to full. And again, our role, when we spoke earlier on about what's our role in terms of that interaction, it might be that we are observing how the children describe the utilities or the utensils, sorry. How effectively are they using the comparison language, bigger, smaller, etc. And if they can begin to categorise the objects according to properties such as shape and size, can they sort them in different ways depending on their properties? So there's lots and lots of opportunities there. Can they notice and describe simple shapes? Are they seeing patterns? Can they select a number of objects from a, a group? So you might say to them, can you pass me two spoons from a group of maybe five or six spoons? And can they make comparisons between quantities and say which is more or less? Some of this is really abstract for the children, but again, going back to that experience through the mud kitchen, really allows them to develop that context vocabulary, but also some of the deeper thinking in terms of some of those more abstract concepts. You'll notice in the slide some suggestions about what other objects you might want to add over time. So again, you could add a timer, you could add a stopwatch, and that would develop that idea of time awareness and time duration. You might want to add some numeral cards. And again, you'll see that I've added um, the, the representation of three, either with the number name or with the, the digit, but actually using the dot patterns, irregular dot patterns, as well as irregular dot patterns. Again, that helps develop that idea of subitizing. And I'm not saying you would add all of these at the one time, but it's taking that one concept of the mud kitchen and just developing that language over time. And you'll know that the children will be developing some um, context vocabulary there too. So they're going to know the names of some of these shapes and some of these objects that you see as well as the mathematical language. So lots and lots of opportunities there to make that experience really rich in terms of a mathematical experience just by the addition of a few different objects or a few different resources. So have a think about that when we look at the next slide. And again, think about the questions that are posed here. So what, where are the opportunities for mathematical development? What questions might you ask? What vocabulary might you hear the children using? What vocabulary might you use and model so that the children are picking that up? In terms of vocabulary, some examples might include stones, rocks, boulders, flat, smooth, round, circular, oblong, rough. The, I could go, go on and on. And again, as the children arrange the materials, you might want to encourage them to count how many of each of each item they've chosen. And then you might say to them, let's count how many items you're going to use to make the eyes or the nose or the mouth or the hair. And you're doing that maybe through modelling, but you're listening in to make sure the children have got that idea of counting um, and they're doing that effectively. 
It would be a great experience for them to practice counting five objects and saying one number name for each item, for example, or maybe providing more of a, di a direction for the children, depending on their age and stage of development. So could they make an alien face, for example, with three eyes? So you're giving them a bit more, um, a bit more of a steer. Somebody in the chat uh, mentioned symmetry. Yep, could they make a symmetrical pattern using the items provided? And again, you might want to work with the children to sort the items and discuss the different ways they could be sorted. So we could look at the stones and we could sort them by size or by shape, by colour or by texture. So again, very rich in terms of what the children could do and how we can develop that mathematical thinking. Lots of loose parts that could be added in there too. So it's about taking that one activity or provocation and adding to it over time. On the next slide, I'm going to stop talking and I'm going to let you think about it. And again, if you can add your comments as you've been doing to the chat and also to the Padlet to think about the, the sand play. So I'm going to just pause to allow you to think about the questions that are there and where the opportunities are to develop that mathematical thinking. Yep, capacity. Uh huh. Yep. And it's again, think it and go back to this slide again and think about what else could I add to that sand tree that would take that learning again a bit further or deepen that interest and in, in that engagement a wee bit further. Get yep, lots of things coming in here about capacity and that language of measure is coming through. Yep. And the idea of more or less, again, quite a, an abstract concept for children. But again, if we're doing that in context with the children, they've got that experience to link it back to. And we could add scales, yep, we could add water, and that might take the learning down a different direction. Fantastic. Yep. I think just because of time, Yvonne will move on, but these ideas are, are great. And as Yvonne said, we will share them. So if you um, joined the counting webinars that we've mentioned a few times, if you joined them last time, you'll know that we provided some takeaway tasks so that the learning and the discussions would continue beyond just the webinar time. So we've provided on the slide just now, we will provide an example of something that you might want to read. And again, this might be individually, but again, we're trying to encourage that those ideas and those thoughts and discussions are shared across your peers. Um, something to read, something to do and something to share. What we're really hoping is that you take this back and you maybe work with a peer or a full staff team to share your thoughts. And the last one that came through there, that's something to share. Page four of the Numeracy Across Learning document asks you to spend time with your colleagues to consider and discuss one or more of the uh, reflective questions. And that again would be think asking you to take account of your indoor and your outdoor learning environment. And they could be used as part of professional discussions and um, to support that continuous improvement. Some of the, refle the reflective questions that are in that document include in what way do we our everyday routines and interactions help children build fluency and confidence and numeracy skills? Or it might be something you might want to pick the one that's about the interactions, the experiences and spaces and which ones are particularly helpful in developing and extending the numeracy skills. So if you take the, the something to share and you have those discussions, it would be great if you came back and shared that with us at the start of the next session. So something to read, something to do and something to share. We just like to give something away for you to think about between now and the next session. Okay, I've put a, a link um, to the chat earlier on, but we'll maybe post another link to this. So we've mentioned the counting series a few times, and that is the, the one on the top left hand side, the one that's in yellow, is the Padlet that I referred to earlier that holds all the information that was shared during the counting series. So if you weren't able to come along, you can access all the videos, the recordings and everything on the counting um, Padlet. And we're also going to do it, as I said earlier on, we're also going to do that for this session so that everything's held in one place. So we'll post those links in just a second. 
And just a reminder that our next session is the 22nd of November. And we've mentioned it a few times, but we are going to look at numeracy and maths outdoors and we would love you to join us. And again, the third session is the 24th of January and we're going to be looking at that curiosity sorry, and creativity. So definitely worth you coming along and signing up to those. And that's just the Padlet that we'll be using for this session um, where we'll hold all the information. I will we'll talk about that. We'll just post the links and for the Padlets and then we are going to open up for just, I think somebody's got their, their microphone on. Yep, thank you. <laughs> um, the very last slide is just a wee final thought and any final questions and we'll answer those questions in the chat in a second and we'll post the Padlet link in again. But one of the things I wanted you to take away was just thinking about that question or that thought bubble. If we just thought about implementing one numeracy rich practice a month, in a year's time, you will have embedded 12 numeracy rich experiences. And even if we were only to be going to do half of that, we're still going to have six rich experiences for numeracy that will help embed that learning. So have a wee think about that one. And just to finish off by saying a, a thank you for all of you, not only for just attending tonight, but for your interaction and for your comments. It's been gratefully received. We'll make sure we share all of that. Yvonne, I don't know if you've picked up anything in the chat that I've missed, but I'm just going to pop the Padlet link into the chat again. Yeah, Maria, a few people are saying, oh, how do we sign up for session two and three? So the fact that you've signed up for this one, the events team will sign, you'll get the link out for session two and session three. And just before people pop off, hot off the press, the Maths Week Scotland packs are available. And this year, um, Maria and I have fought to get one specifically for early learning and childcare. So I'll pop that in the link. My team don't even know that it's gone live, so I'm sharing it with you before I share it with them. Um, so again, we'll maybe make sure you get that link um, so that you can start to use some of those ideas in your Maths Week Scotland plan, which is in two weeks time. So just a, wee, a big thank you to everybody for joining. And surprisingly, we finished with two minutes to spare, Yvonne. I don't know how we managed that, but we did. <laughs> but if anybody has got any final thoughts or questions, please just um, either post them in the chat or come in. And thank you for all your comments in the chat pane. That's really see helpful. Hand up there. Maria, there's a hand up. I just see that there. Yep. If you want to come in um, and ask your question, please just come in. To... River, maybe? Is it Riva? River? Sorry, it's Leslie. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Hi, Leslie. I, I just wondered um, all the links because the, the chat's going 100 mile an hour. <laughs> and I'm, I was going to threaten to press on the chat the, the links for like, the Padlet and different things. Could they be sent to? Yes. Um, You'll get them out. Yeah, yeah so it, the events team will send it out the next couple of days, the link to the Padlet um, and the recording will be on there and everything because, yeah, we appreciate it. It moves too quickly for us to read. Never mind everyone yeah. else. <laughs> exactly. Right, thanks very much. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Leslie.
Hi Linda, I don't know if you're still on the call. Linda Hill, who's asked saying she can't make the next webinar, you will get a recording on that Padlet that I put into the chat. Um, you'll get a recording of the next session, so you'll be able to access it there. Hope that helps. Not seen any further questions on the Padlet, Yvonne. So um, I think we're probably good to close the call. Just maybe another minute. And I'm scrolling through the chat. We've probably missed stuff, but if we do miss anything, um, we'll try and respond okay, and, just and drop pick us it up. Email if there's yeah. anything that we've missed. And I think I'll just stop the recording just now, Maria.